Hello and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome everyone. I'm Amy Davidson, the Executive Director of North America at the Climate Group, and thank you all for joining. Aha, for joining us. For joining us, and now I've got my camera on, for joining us to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. It's wonderful that so many people have tuned in from around the world. We have folks from Quebec to Argentina, Italy, India, and as far away as Japan and Australia. First, let me say that our thoughts are with everyone affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, the most urgent threat facing humanity today. We know it's, it's changed all of our lives swiftly and created a new extreme uncertainty. But our commitment to tackling the climate crisis remains unwavering, and it's the most urgent threat facing humanity over the long term. Thank you to our members, our partners, and funders who are joining. During these uncertain economic times, your ongoing support is critical for us to continue our work to drive climate action. And welcome to all of you who are new. We have an exciting webinar this morning featuring three climate leaders from different companies, Cliff Bar, Mars, and the Inca Group, or what's known as IKEA. The format of the event will be as follows. I'll start with a brief overview of, cli of the climate group, then each company will share a short presentation of their work and commitments. And after that, we'll move into a panel discussion and follow with some question and answers. If you have a question, you can type it into the questions box, which you should see on your screen now, and you can do that throughout the presentations. Um, and then me and my team will select a few of the questions at the end and share them with me. So next slide. So the Climate Group, for some of you who don't know, we're an independent global not-for-profit with offices, which I must say are now empty, in New York City, London, our headquarters, and in New Delhi. Our mission is to accelerate climate action for a world of no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius. Thank you. And we do this by bringing together powerful networks of businesses and subnational governments to shift global markets and policies towards this goal. So this is, okay. No, 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 so can we go back on the slide? Thank you very much. So science tells us that we must cut uh, greenhouse gas emissions in half this decade, so by, the, by 2030, if we have a chance of staying within the 1.5 degrees global warming limit. So this is the climate decade. And we cannot make a dent in that goal unless we begin to see a deep shift away from fossil fuels to a global clean energy economy and one that works for everyone. That's why our key um, areas of focus, which you see on the screen, is the clean energy transition through our three signature programs that we, that we work with businesses on. And we're working with over 300 multinational companies across sectors from IT and healthcare to telecoms and automotive. At the top, you'll see EP100, which drives smarter and more efficient energy use because the cheapest fuel is the fuel we don't use. RE100 is where companies commit to source 100% renewable electricity across their global operations. And EV100, companies commit to electrifying their fleet and installing charging infrastructure to make EVs the new normal by 2030. And this also improves our health by cleaning up the air we breathe. And around the world right now, we're reminded that clean air is critical in what it looks like. Next slide. The Climate Group also works with a network of subnational governments through our Under Two Coalition, where we serve as Secretariat. The Under Two Coalition brings together more than 220 states and regional governments, representing over 1.3 billion people and 43% of the global economy. All are committed to bold climate action and innovative policies to prevent the worst impacts of climate change. And the importance of city, state, and regional government leadership right now cannot be overstated. As we have seen in the U.S., the actions and responses by mayors and governors on the front line of the COVID pandemic has been critical to saving lives and will be critical for climate change and climate action. Next slide. The Climate Group also runs Climate Week NYC each, sep each September during the UN General Assembly when heads of state gather. We gather climate leaders from around the world and across sectors to drive further climate action, share solutions and progress, and brainstorm and network on how to do more. And yes, this year, 2020, the start of the climate decade, 
Climate Week NYC will launch with a unique virtual platform to ensure that we can continue to engage and drive the momentum for action around the world. With November's COP26 being postponed, Climate Week will be the most important event of the year. So please mark your calendars for September 21st through the 27th, 2020, because we're all in this together, whether it's COVID or climate change, and only by working together can we ensure that the climate decade is, is a success and we can ensure a clean, safe, healthy, and prosperous future for all. So now with that, I'm going to um, introduce our first guest, who is Elisa Hammond, and she is the SVP of Envi Environmental Stewardship at Cliff Bar. Elisa? Thank you so much, Amy, and good morning, everyone. It's an honor to be here. I'm grateful for everyone and exciting to be um, talking to you around the world and especially grateful to the climate group that's made this opportunity possible for us to collaborate. Um, first slide, please. For those of you who don't know Cliff Bar, we are a family and employee owned company that we make um, nutrition and energy bars originally for athletes, but now for everyone. And we were founded in in 1992 and we say that Cliff Bar was born on a bike because the founder was on a 170 mile bike ride and he was a baker and he um, realized that he needed a different kind of energy bar that was nutritious and delicious and healthy and that's where, when the idea was born. Now we've grown to be 1200 plus employees. Our headquarters are in California and we have two bakeries, one in Idaho and another in Indiana. Next slide, please. So our, our sustainability work was founded on a commitment to transition to organic agriculture and organic ingredients. And we have done that starting in 2003. And, but if you look at this visual, you'll see that our commitment to sustainability is a holistic commitment and it's commit, built on organic, but also our commitments um, that also show up with the climate group, a commitment to 100% renewable electricity, a commitment to climate neutral business operations, fit beautifully, align beautifully with the mission of the climate group. We also recognize that as a, as a relatively small company compared to my colleagues here and businesses around the world, so we need to influence other businesses and help build the climate movement. So the work we do, we have our eye on how we can collaborate and scale up. So we've committed to two of the goals, RE100 and EV100, and we look to partnerships like this in order to scale our impact. Next slide, please. In the world of 100% renewable electricity, we are already using green power at all of our facilities. We purchase renewable energy credits, and we also have significant solar arrays on our headquarters in Emeryville. Back, please. And this recent uh, five-acre solar array at our bakery in Idaho, which just opened up last year. We also have a program called 5050, where we're driving clean energy into our supply chain, telling our suppliers that we treat energy like an ingredient when we buy ingredients or packaging from our suppliers. We're also buying the embedded uh, electricity that's in each product, used to make each product. So we provide free consulting to our supply chain partners to help them find ways to go green. And the final thing, next slide, please. We're really excited about our solar farm in Idaho because we're we've interplanted the solar array with native flowering plants so that the solar array not only generates clean energy for our bakery, but also provides habitat for pollinators. Everyone in the food world knows that our pollinators are at risk, which is um, with one out of every three bites of food, depending on a pollinator, this is of critical importance that we not only scale up clean power, but do it in a way that solves multiple problems. In addition, when you plant uh, flowering plants underneath solar panels, it improves energy efficiency on hot days. It is also, research is showing it's storing carbon in the soil significantly more than with the a conventional turf. And we, it's allowing for additional benefits. For example, we now also are purchasing honey, solar grown honey 
that from another in, uh, solar farm we've invested in with a significant um, array of native plants. Next slide, please. And under EV100, we have committed to both um, installing EV charging infrastructure at all our facilities, which we've already done, but we'll continue to scale up as more and more employees purchase electric or, or plug-in hybrids. Um, go back once a minute. I just wanna say um, we also have an employee benefit program and uh, more than half of our employees are participating in that incentive program. Thank you. Super, thank you, Elisa. Um, so you get a good flavor, <laughs> no pun intended, of what Cliff Bar is doing. And now I want to introduce um, Kevin Rabinovich, who is the Global VP of Sustainability at Mars. Kevin, over to you. Great, thanks, Amy, and thanks everyone for uh, for joining. Um, very happy to be here. Uh, you know, uh, happy to to be here, particularly as uh, as Mars was part of actually helping launch uh, RE100. So I had the privilege of uh, of being on stage with a few of my colleagues at Climate Week six years ago to uh, to launch RE100. So a uh, little bit of a slide here about Mars. Uh, most people probably know who we are. Very large, privately owned food business. Uh, operate all over the world. Little over 100 years old as as a business. Um, mostly we are known for our confectionery business, so our, uh, our chocolate or, or chewing gum businesses, the, the Wrigley brands, the Mars Wrigley there in the bottom. But uh, not everyone knows that we're also the world's largest manufacturer of pet food uh, and have a, a very large what we call food business, which is sort of rice and soups and, and sauces. Next slide, please. So uh, for a bit of context, uh, this is our entire carbon footprint uh, on the left there, so 33 million tons or so. And, and our direct operations are, you know, those factories and offices all over the world are that dark blue bar at the bottom. So like, like most businesses, our direct operations are relatively, food businesses at least, our direct operations are a relatively small part of, of the total. Um, but within that, and, and this chart has both good news and bad news, we, we have a commitment to get the direct operations, that thin blue wedge down to zero, by 2040, and, uh, and a commitment to reduce our entire supply chain footprint by, by two thirds. But for today, we're, we're talking about the electricity part of that uh, little blue wedge at the bottom. So I have some great numbers to show you, but for context, they're, they're part of a much bigger, uh, bigger climate story. Next, please. So the, uh, the first uh, substantial project that we did in renewables was uh, a little over a decade ago. It uh, at an M and M chocolate factory in uh, in New Jersey, and you can you can see it there. It's uh, it's 18 acres. Um, it's about the same size as the physical uh, plant, which you can see sort of behind it in the background. And uh, and you know we we were very excited about this. You had a you had the great ribbon cutting ceremony, and of course the characters always show up, and and you'll see there in the photo as well. Um, uh, Governor Whitman, uh, who was uh, also uh, head of the EPA at one point in time. So, you know, great, great, very exciting for us. Um, and I'm actually going to follow up with Elise after this about the idea of uh, planting some pollinators and habitat underneath those solar panels. So, uh, so inspiration already from the webinar. But that was two megawatts, which we were very proud of, but it works out to be about 3% of the uh, electricity use at, at that facility. Um, and, you know, that that really kind of opened our eyes, both in a good way and a bad way. One, that we could do it, and two, that quantitatively it, it made such a small difference. Um, and, and so that really led us to thinking about going bigger and further and faster, and, and that meant we needed to go off-site. And as soon as we went off-site, we realized we could aggregate load from multiple facilities, because if you're off-site from one facility, that same wind farm or solar farm could be the offsite facility for multiple locations. So if we go to the next slide, please, that has led us to where we are today. Um, so, so what we've got here are, are little photos from, from four of the projects we've done that represent 100% of our electricity load in each of their countries. So I'll, I'll start in the upper left and go, go um, well, I guess I'll go, well, I'll tell you where I'm going. So in the upper left is, construction of a wind farm in uh, La Mesa, Texas, which was a 200 megawatt uh, project that covered all of our U.S. operations, uh, and, and that was built in 2015. Our big learning on that project, I'll, I'll give you some sort of key insights from each of these, our big learning on that project was have a backup plan. Um, that was the first one we'd done at large scale, and we were 
six months in negotiating with the developer and it fell apart. And we actually had to go back to one of the other developers that had been part of the RFP process. So our, our insight there was, um, you know, once you go through the process, you know, keep keep some backup options alive and, and, and working until you're really sure you're there. The next one we did was in the top right, which was in the UK. Um, so it's a, a wind farm in, in Scotland, again, supplying all of our uh, facilities in the UK. And, and our interesting insight there was, even though there's clear policy support for wind in the UK, and you know we know this is aligned with our global goals, there were still some people locally that were not happy uh, about about wind turbines being put in in the Scottish Highlands. Um, and and our insight there was, not everyone's going to love you, uh, and and you need to be prepared for and anticipate that. Um, you know, nine out of ten will. But, but you will get shouted at by that one person. And, and that's something you need to be sort of prepared for and, and have your, your senior leaders and, and your owners and your business aware of and, and conscious of that you're, you're making the right decision, even if not everyone is happy about it. The next one we did in the lower left was in, uh, was in Mexico. Um, and uh, you can see there some of the, the team that, that worked on it with the, the project in the background. Um, our big insight there was delays happen. So we uh, we had a plan of, of when it was supposed to start up and we'd sort of banked on it in our, our GHG glide paths and the project startup was delayed by a year. Um, and, and so we had to scramble a little bit to, to think about that. And, you know, these are these are big, complicated construction projects with lots of permitting wrinkles. And so, you know, be, be aware that there there can be there can be delays. And then the final one on the, the bottom right is uh, the project in Australia that we've, we've done, which will be coming up shortly. It's our first big solar project. So we're, we're buying part of a several hundred megawatt um, or the output from part of a several hundred megawatt farm. And, and the interesting thing about that one is the, the gentleman in the picture there is actually the general manager of our pet food business in Australia. And he actually came to us as the corporate team asking us to do Australia next as a renewable project. And that was the first time we'd had a business unit coming to us saying, we want you to do a project here, as opposed to us coming to them and saying, hey, we want to do a project. And that was a real tipping point of, of getting demand from inside the business to, to do projects, which I think is a, is a testament both to how these things build momentum and, and how the landscape has, has changed over time. Um, so with that, we can go to the last slide. So where we are today as Mars, and, and those four projects I just showed are, are on the map here, um, as well as a, a number of other shorter term contracts that we have covering a lot of those countries in Europe. And cumulatively, all of this gets us to 53% to of, uh, of our global electricity use covered through 100% um, renewable contracts. So um, just a bit of a quick oversight and, and some, uh, some insights from, from along the way. And with that, I'll uh, I'll pass it back to uh, to Amy to hand over to the next presenter. Super, thank you, Kevin, and to the audience and to the speakers. Sorry, a little bit about the slides jumping around. We're trying to get that um get that fixed. So apologies, and thank you for bearing with us. So now our last speaker is Carol Gabinski, who is the head of climate and energy at Inca or IKEA Group, and Carol is coming to us from Sweden. So Carol, over to you. Uh, hello everyone, I hope you are doing well in this challenging uh, time. Uh, thank you Climate Group for the invitation. So uh, Inca Group uh, brings IKEA to 30 markets. We operate 374 stores and uh, online sales within these markets. There are three parts of the uh, Inca business. One of them is IKEA retail, the other one is uh, Inca centers meeting places, and the third one is uh, Inca investment. Uh, Inca Group, uh, together with other companies contributing to IKEA brand, have a common uh, commitment, uh, which you can see on the next slide, where IKEA committed to become climate positive by 2030 by reducing more greenhouse gas emissions than what IKEA value chain emits by 2030. And we are committed as well to uh, Paris Agreement and 1.5 ambition to reduce the emissions by half through drastically reducing emissions and removing emissions from the atmosphere and storing in land, plants and products. And on the next slide, uh, you can see 
four main action areas that uh, we are taking to become climate positive. The first one, drastic reduction of emissions. It's about striving towards using 100% renewable energy across the IKEA value chain. Then the second part is about transforming to become circular business model and promote sustainable consumption, which is very important, especially from the material footprint perspective. And the third area within the drastic reduction is about using renewable and recycled materials within the products which we offer. And today, 60% of material is renewable material and 10% is recycled materials that are being used with, within IKEA products. And then the third part is about uh, offering more plant-based options uh, for IKEA customers. The second part about storing carbon in land plants and products, it is about better forestry and agriculture management. And here it is about how do we remove the carbon from the atmosphere and, and store it in the soil, in the plants, in the products, and later, it is about being part of the circular economy where products and materials are storing the carbon for longer time. Then the third part is about going beyond IKEA value chain emissions. And here we are talking, for example, about enabling our customers to generate and use renewable energy at home. And already today, we offer home solar on many of the markets to enable our customers to be part of the renewable energy journey and benefit as well from the affordable renewable energy techno technologies to lower down the energy cost. And the fourth area, it's not measurable area, but it's a very important one. It is about partnerships and collaboration. And for us, working together with others is crucial part of moving this agenda further to create much more inclusive, and uh, simple regulations that are enabling many people to be part of this transition, for example. And on the next slide, you can see uh, two commitments that uh, were uh, to RE100 and EV100. And the uh, Inca Group is uh, one of the founding members of RE100, where we committed first that we will uh, invest in renewable energy and will own and operate uh, renewable energy investments. So until now, we uh, invested 2.5 billion euro in uh, on-site and off-site renewable energy generation. And already today, we secured uh, investments that are enabling us to generate equivalent of the renewable energy we consume in our operations through more than 500 uh, turbines, which we operate on 14 markets, and two solar farms, and more than uh, 920,000 solar modules uh, covering uh, rooftops and uh, parking areas in some of the locations. But this is not the end of the journey when it comes to renewable energy. The second part is about how do we secure that we consume 100% renewable electricity across all the markets. today. 66% of our renewable, our electricity consumption is renewable, and this helps us to reduce the emissions by half from the electricity use for, for our operations. As a next step, we are looking especially into China and Russia uh, to secure renewable electricity uh, consumption through on site and off site uh, investment. Then the, there is a part as well about renewable heating and cooling, where we committed to use 100% renewable heating and cooling uh, by 2030. And this is just Inca commitment, but the total IKEA value chain is working towards being powered by 100% renewable energy. Then the second commitment is EV100, where uh, we committed to offer EV charging stations at all our stores and customer meeting points by the end of this year plus by 2025 to offer only zero emission delivery for our customers. Uh, there are five pilot uh, cities, uh, Amsterdam, Los Angeles, New York, Paris, and Shanghai. And already today, all the deliveries uh, in Shanghai uh, have zero emission uh, vehicles fleet. And uh, I will stop here and looking forward to the discussion. And please don't forget to submit the question. 
Super, thank you, Carol. And now as we're gonna, we're gonna switch over to our conversation. So I think we'll be getting the webcams back up. And while we're doing that, if um, just to remind everybody that there is a question box or chat box, so hopefully you can see that. So feel free to start um, putting your questions in so we can begin to, to collate them. Fantastic, you guys are all doing such amazing work. I mean, thank you. Uh, got a, we've got a lot ahead of us. So I wanna just like start, um, here with a question for all of you, and maybe I'll kick it to Carol first, but you know, given the magnitude of the COVID uh, crisis, I mean, this pandemic we know is, is deep and broad everywhere. Um, are you feeling that sort of the, the companies are gonna still be able to keep their commitments under this? And, and how will that possibly slow down some of the efforts and work that you are doing? Um, the, you know, the shadow is going to be cast pretty wide. So Carol, do you want yeah. to just give us a couple thoughts about how IKEA is thinking about this? Sure. So first of all, COVID-19 is of course impacting many people and uh, communities uh, and, uh, and business. And uh, to live up to our vision to create better everyday life for the many people, it is uh, important to support the communities and people and our coworkers within this challenging time. And uh, that's why we launched as well the support funds of uh, 26 uh, million euro as well to uh, support people and communities within this uh, time. Uh, when it comes to climate, we know that we cannot slow down and uh, we need to think long term. And we know the issue of the climate change is not disappearing. And especially when we look from the uh, transformation perspective, we know that Renewable energy can offer more affordable energy for the people, can create many jobs when it comes to construction, maintenance across in many regions. The same when we look on uh, zero emission transportation, a uh, circular uh, business model. So especially during this recovery package uh, time, it is important to put the climate action to create more fair and inclusive society and think long term when we are taking now the decisions about the recovery. Yeah, no, absolutely. We've got that narrative of build back better and we have to make sure we, we take that opportunity. Um, Kevin, I know you had some interesting um, experience at, with Mars and how are you guys thinking about COVID and how is it impacting you and your climate commitments? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I think obviously it, I think there's a couple interesting lessons that come out of this. So one is, um, you know, we are all doing all kinds of things that, that we thought were unimaginable, <laughs> you know, two, two months ago. You know, I, I had a conversation with someone recently who said, you know, we used to have a policy that people could work from home two days a month. And we had a long discussion about whether to expand it to four days a month. And the concern was that it would diminish productivity. So we didn't do it. And then three weeks later, we're all working from home one month per month. <laughs> so, you know, I think this idea of recalibrating what is possible um, is, although we have we have unfortunately been forced into it by a tragedy, the the opportunity is is to is to take that as a as a bit of a wake up call that we don't necessarily have to make slow creeping incremental progress on on things that we care about, and and we know climate is something that that we all could and and should care about. The other thing I would say is, you know, at, at a more sort of tactical level. Um, you know, obviously within Mars and I'm sure within everyone else's businesses, the, the very operationally focused teams are, are massively disrupted by this. Um, you know, there's all kinds of things going on with, with keeping supply chains moving and stores open and closed and so on and so forth. But, you know, the reality is, is when, when you're thinking about renewable energy, you're not, that, that's not a daily operational thing in most cases. That's more of a longer term plan. Um, and, and so for us, um, you know, we're, we're, we're just continuing on. I mean, we, we actually reviewed, uh, our next two projects with our CFO last week, um, by webcam. <laughs> it's the first time we've done that, but, um, but yeah, so, so I think it, it's important that we, that we keep moving. I think this is, um, you know, I, I think maybe another lesson to take from, from COVID is that, uh, you know, investments in, in preparation and preventing problems are always, almost always better than, than the costs of, of dealing with the consequences and, and cleaning up afterwards. 
Um, and and I you know I think that's something to always keep in mind in in the in the climate space uh, that certainly is is well known to this audience, but um, but you know is something that figures in our thinking as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I hear some, you know, funding going into like renewable investment funds has just been skyrocketing over the past uh, couple of weeks because people sort of are, are making the connections, which is terrific. And Elisa, what are you what are you seeing at, at Cliff Bar and how's COVID impacting you and, and your commitments? And I think um, I would echo a lot of the things Kevin just talked about. One thing, just having everyone work from home changes the whole conversation about how, oh, should we do this? Will, will this impact company culture? And all of a sudden we are all at home that are working in the office and it's effective. And when we look at our own um, carbon footprint of the business operations, business travel is, is significant. And it felt before like, oh, we, we must fly to go to these meetings. And we're learning that there's, it can be a very effective way like we're doing right now. We are keeping the bakeries open like many essential businesses, but at the same time, um, our sustainability team is working on developing our science-based targets. And those meetings are continuing to move forward because I think people recognize this is more important than ever. We shift meetings based on what is urgently needed to respond to COVID, but this is staying on everyone's to-do list. Some things might slow down, but we are, we're committed for the long term. And I do think tying, um, connecting the dots between, for example, clean air, climate action, people's health, it, um, mm. it really sparks a new way of thinking. And what I am, we all realize, we need to think in a transformative way. Incremental is not going to do the job. No, absolutely. Thank, thank you for those thoughts. So just start building a little bit on when you guys made your initial sort of big commitments, whether it was RE or EV100, um, you know, what were some of those key drivers at the time? And do you think COVID is going to change or shift those drivers over this decade? You know, whether it's customer expectations, employees, investors, um, and maybe I'll go to Carol first. Matt. Yeah. I, I think what we see that we've been doing the climate action starts at home research uh, in 2016, then we repeated last year again. And what we see based on that research and the recent research coming from uh, last week's as well, that people's expectations towards us to act, it's just growing. And I think for businesses, it's clear that if you would like to have uh, co-workers who are passionate about the job, who would like to work with you and be together with you, you need to put uh, solving social challenges and planetary challenges into the center of your business. Because we are looking for these meaningful jobs to contribute to this problem that we see every day around us and uh, we hear about it. So now it's becoming even more tangible how fragile we are as the people living on this planet and uh, how much it depends from our action and uh, how much it matters if we all act together and how big impact we are having when we are acting together. And uh, I think this is definitely the part which uh, we will see that it's not changing and it will be even growing. From, and, uh, you know, companies are looking from the cost perspective, revenue perspective, risk perspective. And I believe that risk uh, part on the climate part is becoming more and more tangible uh, through this, this crisis as well. Because uh, we see that how uh, it will can, can impact the total value chain of, of the companies and how quickly it can change. Because I think we've been all, uh, as Kevin said previously, very often we thought, Oh, the, ch uh, the change is so difficult, it takes so much time, but what we will learn through this difficult time that actually we can change uh, rapidly and uh, we can take this lesson further when it comes to climate action because we know that if we all act as a government, businesses and individuals, this will bring very fast change when it comes to decarbonization. No, no, absolutely. I mean, you think about, you know, COVID being uh, sort of a dress rehearsal for what's to come. And there's only sort of one of these critical vector risk vectors hitting us. And 
they're going to be multiple as we come down the road. And so our ability, it's great that we're able to see that our ability to change so quickly. So Elisa, do you have uh, thoughts on that from, from the drivers that you've been seeing? You think they're going to be accelerated post-COVID? Uh, Amy, originally, if I heard your question, it was about what drove us to join EV100 and RE100. Is That's still the question I would just like to yes, talk about that because um, to be honest, when I first heard about it at the climate meetings in New York, I thought we're a small company relative to some of the big corporations. What value would we bring to joining RE100? And we were already committed to 100% renewable electricity. And I also thought well, our marketing fleet is very small. Well, how could we um, contribute to EV100? But when I talked to the climate group um, team and also thought about our mission being to build the movement, I have been so happy that we have joined. I really, it's um, provided a international platform and community to be part of. Um, and I, EV100 has been challenging for us to think about how our logistics team um, and, and logistics partners can transition to clean vehicles for shipping. And the EV100 community that we're part of has been really helpful. We're learning from companies like IKEA and some of the amazing members in EV100. And now when I take these commitments back to Cliff Bar, it's very clear as well as sharing with some of our supply chain partners. We, we met with one asking them to use green power. And I said, by the way, you're an international company. Why don't you join RE100? And so um, I feel like this is a very tangible way to be part of the movement. Oh, fantastic. Thank you, Elisa. We, we think so too. I'm glad to hear it that our, our members do too. I think the sharing and the networking is critical, even though we're doing it now online, yeah. which is, is in a way certain better than some other mm -hmm. um, opportunities. And Kevin, did you want to um, add anything about you know, the, the reason to join RE and EV? Well, you didn't join EV, but that's okay. RE, because you don't <laughs> have the fleet. Um, but sort of those drivers for you and whether you think yeah, shifting I at all? I mean, so shifting, the short answer is no. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the reason we set um, GHG and, and, and climate targets uh, to start with, and, and then of course our commitment to RE100 is, is part of the strategy to deliver against our climate targets, is climate science. Um, so, so, you know, IPCC AR4, for, for those that are sort of geeks in this area, was the 2007 version of the, the UN climate report. And, and that was enough for us to, to, to decide we needed to, to get going in the space. And so we, we started setting targets back in, in 2009 on our direct operations and then have since expanded to cover our, our, our full supply chain. Um, and, and, you know, obviously that wasn't the only reason. And of course we had to think about feasibility and strategy, but, but fundamentally climate science was the motivating factor. And, and the signals from climate science have only gotten stronger and less uncertain over time uh, about the reason to act. So, so in that sense, we're, we're, we're unwavering. I think the, the positive surprise over time and, and, you know, both, both Carol and Elisa alluded to this is the number of non-climate benefits of the work. Um, so the, the way it, it makes people prouder of working for what was already a great company. Um, you know, but, but when they're, when they're at the neighborhood barbecue, it's a, it's a little more exciting to tell a story about my company is, is, has, you know, is buying energy from a wind farm than it is, you know, I insulated a pipe last week. <laughs> um, you know, both critically important things to do, but, but one of them does make for a better story than the other. Right. And, and, you know, that's, that's not to be, uh, that's not to be overlooked. Um, you know, and that's just one of, one of a hundred examples of, of some of those other benefits. Um, yeah, you know, I think the, the, um, the other thing that, that, that's powerful, and this sort of gets back to my, the, the point I made in my last comment, is the RE part is great, but the 100 is almost the more powerful part, right? Yeah. Um, you know, when, when you're trying to think about how to make things 5% better or 5% less worse, you, you, you're, you're in one sort of mindset, right? You're in a continuous improvement, incremental, nip, nibble away at the problem sort of mindset. 
when when you're challenged to to deliver 100 percent or or to mm -hmm. get to zero if you're measuring the bad side of things you know that that sort of kicks you out of that that mindset and says all right we, we got to do something completely different right you know i i can't just keep doing a couple megawatt on-site projects here there the other side the other because i'm i'm never going to get to 100 percent that way so i need a different strategy you know that the, the fact that our targets were calling on us to get to zero in our direct operations, which meant 100% renewable energy, meant we had to think about going offsite. And if not for that 100% target that we'd set on, on GHG reductions, we never would have thought about doing, you know, 200 megawatt wind farms in Texas and, and things like that. And so I think there, there's real power in that 100. Um, you know, 100 is not twice 50. <laughs> it's, 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 it's much more than that. No, no, absolutely. We believe it, it sets the North Star pretty clearly. Um, just to dig down a little bit to some of the commitments that we talked about, I'm just looking at time too. It, it goes by quickly when you have such interesting people um, to, to chat with and hopefully everybody um, is learning a lot as they're, as they're listening in. Um, I want to get to supply chains because each all three of you talked about that. Um, but then just picking up on Kevin, what you just said, uh, well, two things. First, I loved your slide sort of showing how much, you know, the, the electricity piece is part of the footprint for, um, for Mars. And just wanted to say that the climate group is also, you know, looking into how we can affect change within the land and healthy ag sector. So love to talk to with everybody online as well as, as you guys later about that. Um, so, so then, I guess we just, I was just going to say from your 100% as you have a global strategy and obviously certain countries are easier than others and you've been prioritizing obviously countries that had the more enabling policy environment. So what's sort of your next big, um, if you can share your, your next big country that you're going to be going after? Yeah, so so really there's, I assume you're still asking me, so so I think there's there's three there's three factors that come into the sequencing of, of things. So the, the, the first one is um, how big is our load there, right? So do we have one factory? Do we have 20? Uh, and, and how carbon intensive is it? Um, so we have, a, we have a pie chart where we break down, you know, every country, how much is it contributing to our, our emissions footprint? And then the third is, is you know, how, uh, how economically friendly <laughs> is that market to, to, to doing a deal? Um, and, and sort of the algorithm that we're working is we're trying to deliver a certain amount of GHG reduction every year, and we're looking to do it in the places that we can do it with the best economics. And, and that's, the, that's the sort of formula that we're, we're trying to solve. Um, you know, I would say the, the areas that we're, we're looking at next, and actually this, this bridges to the supply chain comments, is um, – so we, we've done many, but not all the countries where we have a very large footprint and, and we're now getting to the countries where, you know, maybe we don't have 10 factories, we have two. Um, and, and our load is perhaps not quite big enough to get the best deal economics. So we're, we're actually starting to look into working in um, consortiums with some of our suppliers uh, where we work together with them and, and collectively have enough volume to get the best economics on, on a deal. Um, and, uh, and that actually gets to, to another program we've, we've launched, which we call the, the Pledge for Planet, where we've called, which we launched at Climate Week last year, actually, where, where we've called on our suppliers to commit to either a science-based target, 100% renewable electricity, or 100% renewable energy more broadly, which which pulls in another group that Carol and I are part of, the, the Renewable Thermal Collaborative, which looks at the, the thermal side of this question. Um, so, so that's what we're starting to, to work on, and I think there's there's going to be a number of European countries where we uh, where we look at uh, at doing some of those projects. China is always interesting, um, and and we've we've had a few runs at China. Um, the the environment for for doing uh, long-term, large-scale offsite deals there is maturing slowly. Um, I, it, I don't know if it's quite there yet, but it's it's getting closer all the time. Super, super. And so I'm going to go to Carol, and then we'll switch to Elisa. Just um, Carol, do you just want to comment a little bit about your work on the supply chain, and also, you know, maybe your your commitment so far in RE100 and EV100, and mm -hmm. how you feel that they've sort of had an impact on the market. Yeah, I think 
China is always an interesting market, as uh, building on what Kevin uh, said. I think that uh, when it comes to securing renewable electricity consumption, uh, definitely China and Russia are two of the markets where we uh, are focusing to secure the consumption. Then the second part is, is heating, heating and, and cooling, and then scaling up the zero emission deliveries. But what that's from our own operations part. But where we see the big opportunity for the total market and broader society as well, it is about this on-site renewable energy generation, where we can turn many buildings and many homes, many offices into renewable energy power stations. And this can as well mobilize significant investments within the renewable energy sector if there are regulations which are enabling and empowering individuals and energy consumers to become renewable energy prosumers. And that's the part which we are rising today as well and uh, uh, communicating that that's really important area that was not yet fully uh, utilized. And to be as well much more local when it comes to generation of a positive impact. And the same with the home solar and clean energy services, how we can enable not only uh, going into supply chains, but looking from the value chains, how we can enable customers to live within the limits of, the, uh, of one planet. Because when we look on the research again, we see that 3% of the uh, uh, society is mentioning solutions when they talk about climate change. Majority of the people don't think about solutions and then they don't see that they are affordable or convenient. And that's what we need to offer to uh, our customers because we know where the, our biggest footprint is coming from as individuals. We feel uh, bad, we feel guilty about the negative impact that we generate. So this is a business opportunity and responsibility as well to come with the solutions when it comes to renewable energy and circular uh, services, which are enabling people to live with much much smaller footprint uh, on the market uh, on the planet and the looking forward definitely we are already piloting many circular uh, services capabilities to test and try around offering uh, much more products as a service as well so that's uh, that's the big part when we look on all the work that is done within the supply chain within our own operations but how we actually empower individuals through all our work to be relevant. Because business at the end is about find the need, feel the need. And one of the biggest needs that we see today that people would like to have much smaller impacts uh, on the planet. And uh, now especially we will see this growing and we see that already growing based on, based on the research. And uh, this is the big, big focus. Yeah, no, no, thank As it you. was for years of yeah. uh, making everyday life better for people. Yeah, no, thank you. I mean, that's so much part of our, our whole theory of change is that, you know, with companies driving these initiatives, it's making the price come down so everybody then can participate in these solutions. Um, Elisa, so I know you, you've obviously about both RE100 and EV100. Um, you might want to just touch on some supply chain comments that we were talking about before, but also on your EV100 path. Um, can you just share a little bit about, you know, what your, any challenges that you've had and sort of how your employees have responded to some of the financial incentives that you've, you've given them? We've, um, yes, we have a sustainability benefits program, which we actually launched in 2000. Six, I believe, in response to our own commitment to renewable energy and climate neutral business operations back then, employees said, we want to be part of this too. And we created um, a cool commute, cool car incentive program. And it's um, been really, really successful. That um, incentive program is significant. We um, started out giving in, in a $5,000 incentive for fuel efficient hybrids. Now, we, that electric cars came on the market for fuel efficient hybrids and electric cars. And, um, and the incentive over time has gone to 6,500. And I've just learned that we now have more than 60% of all our employees are participating in this program. 
it's a incentive that you can renew every six years. And it, the, the multiple benefits of this high level of an employee engagement, I often say it's hard to even get an email response, you know, from 50% of your employees. So to get 60% participation, where it's very empowering to feel like you're driving change in your own home, in your community, and it, um, and then in speaking to HR and hearing about additional benefits I never imagined. For example, people are saying just the ability for um, someone to own a more reliable car, and um, and people you know, don't, aren't late to work or have other family challenges because the, the car broke down. We find that these, um, these kind of employee engagements. In addition, related to RE100, we have a um, sustainable home benefit program where we provide um, yearly funds that employees can use to improve energy efficiency and to put solar on their homes. So Carol, I'd like to talk about how we bring more affordable solar to our community. And, and this ties in with um, this idea of how do you build the movement about engaging and empowering other individuals and organizations. So likewise, with our supply chain program, we're providing free consulting for our supply chain partners. And we're just asking them to green the energy, the electricity that they use on our behalf as a simple first step. Um, so all of those, I feel excited about the change in vision when people become part of the solution. No, fantastic. I realize the time is going by like this. Um, so actually we only have, we're going to switch to the Q&A um, and we're going to have time for one question, which I'll just um, ask each of you to respond to. Um, can you speak to the business case or economic benefits of your organizations in terms of what you've realized in terms in, to transition to clean energy as well as electric vehicles? I don't know who wants to take that first. How about Kevin? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, the, the, the deals we have signed in the last uh, five years have, have all either been cost parity or, or saving money. Um, the, the, the thing I'll say about that, though, is that, that's interesting about renewables is, is in many cases, if, if you're big like us, that the solution is um, a long-term contract. Uh, and and that's part of what helps drive the economics and and it it provoked an interesting discussion for us internally, which is if you if your objective is to be cost parity, you, you can see what what a long term contract the pricing is going to be, but what do you compare that against? Because nobody knows what the long term market price of electricity is going to be, and and if they do, then you know they're not in the business of making candy and pet food. Um, so, uh, so it, it, it provokes sort of an interesting discussion about what are your financial objectives? Are, are you looking to minimize risk versus the market price? Are you looking for certainty in your pricing? And, and, and different companies will have different answers to that. So it, 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 I mean, for us, it, it has worked out the way we, we, have, we have done it, but, but part of what made that possible was we, we spent a little bit of time thinking about quite explicitly what were our financial objectives, right? You know, if, if, if the market price goes up, um, you know, do you want to be beating the market or are you okay to go up with the market? If the market price goes down, are you okay to be losing money or do you want your price to go down? You know, right? And so you, you've got to think through some of those, some of those trade-offs. It's not, it's not quite as simple as, you know, this is three cents and this is four cents. So of course I'm going to do the three cents. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And Carol, are you able to respond to that from your electric vehicle work? What you're sure. I, yeah, I think uh, it's, it, first of all, it is about building the partnerships because you will not do it by yourself within this area to have the good business case. And then you look on the market with a higher maturity and a much more infrastructure around it. And these, of course, improve the, the business case. And then you look on the, not on the initial cost, but as well operational costs, because operational costs of the electric vehicles are, are much lower when we look on the maintenance, but as well uh, on the uh, cost of driving one kilometer with, uh, with electric vehicles. And you need to bring this longer term perspective. And then the, the other parties, how, because you always, when you look on the climate part and integration, you look on the, 
cost structure, revenue structure, and risk mitigation in financial terms. So with electric vehicles can increase your revenues by offering the service, which is not creating negative impact for the local uh, community as well. So it increases your revenue by providing the right services. Then the second one is about looking on the cost reduction, uh, which I mentioned already, and then the risk mitigation, where we are looking what will happen within the city when it comes, when uh, we are realizing now how nice it is to live in not polluted areas. And this is already the movement that started before when it comes to legislation, which is putting the bans on certain uh, vehicles with certain emission, amount of emissions to enter the city centers. So you look from these three areas, cost, revenues, and risk, I think on all the parts that you try to integrate from the climate perspective. Oh, fantastic. So we've got about three minutes left. So Alyssa, do you have a, a comment on what you're seeing from the economics? Just at Cliff Bar, we are legally bound to deliver value on five bottom lines, business, brands, people, planet, community. So when we look at that, it moves us to take these longer term return on investments. That's And then now I think we're also thinking about resilience. So having your on-site solar or strengthening the supply chain or employee base adds to resilience. And just also one of the um, biggest challenges for food companies has been employee retention. So to have employee owners, to have these incentives strengthens that relationship, which is um, a, a critical part of cost. Yeah, no, absolutely. So I'm sorry, I don't have time to ask all any more questions that we have quite a bit in the queue, but you guys know where to find us and to follow up. So I just want to take the time to thank Elisa and Kevin and Carol for just really a fascinating conversation. Obviously, we could go on for inspiring and for inspiring us and hope you know that we know now that business leadership is going to continue and that I really feel like we will be able to cut emissions where we have the capacity and we're seeing that now we have the capacity to change so we can make a transformative change to cut emissions in half um, over this climate decade. Um, I just I think it's, it's fantastic. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And I'd also like to thank the team at the climate group who helped put this together very much. Um, and lastly, I want to thank you, the audience. Um, please feel free to reach out to us. Thank you for connecting and joining across the globe. Um, we really appreciate it. So have a wonderful weekend, everyone. Bye. Yeah, have a good weekend. Thank you. Take care.